All right, guys, in this video, it's a quick review of the Biostats uh, questions. Most of these were taken from the original video that was done uh, five years ago, I think right before I went into residency. And it's basically, I've already, had, already got them worked out. It's mainly meant so that you can see the problem and actually just work it in your head more so than getting a blank problem and trying to figure out, okay, where do I start? Um, to, to pick up speed as you're studying through this, if you already have seen these before, it's just a matter of making sure you have the, have the concept down. And that's what I'm trying to accomplish with this, is just to go fast and to review. You know, and that's pretty much how you can study pretty much any, any topic, but especially math, and it'll save you a lot of time. The first question is a new one. It was sent in by one of the, one of the, uh, the viewers, per se. And uh, so that one is something you've seen, you've seen for the first time with me, but other than that, they're just review questions, mainly from the old videos, just at a very uh, up-tempo pace. So hope you like the video. All right, guys, so we got one, <clears throat> one new problem, and then the rest are gonna be review, very quick review, okay? But the first one says, uh, you know, uh, which of the following statistical changes would most likely be most likely if more asthmatic children were included in the study? Okay, and it gets all the standard error, the mean, upper confidence interval, and lower confidence interval. So, I mean, so, all right, so you got to understand what this is, basically. Um, but you're going to see a lot of this kind of stuff on the step exam. It says, a recent study addresses the role of air pollution and asthma development. 200 children diagnosed with asthma and 400 children without asthma were asked a series of questions regarding their homes. An air pollution index ranging from 0 to 10 is then calculated based on each child's response. The mean air pollution index for children with asthma is calculated at 4.5 with a 95% confidence interval between 3.2 and, and 5.8. Which of the following statistical changes would be most likely if more asthmatic children were included in the study? Okay, so you, you gotta know a couple things here. And, we, and confidence interval is key. The key, with the, the, the key with the confidence interval is that it's like saying, look, when they got all the data, most of that data, most of that data fell within this range. The key with this is I, you never want to use, and we talked about this on the drug ad, is that we never want to use any confidence interval that crosses zero. So anytime you see something like, um, I don't know, negative 1 to 2.5, it crossed zero, right? And so it's no good. But this is good. But anyways, <clears throat> the standard error of the mean, the upper confidence interval is going to be this guy, and the lower confidence interval point is going to be that guy. But the change in this is, well, what happens to this confidence interval where things should fall within that range if you put more asthmatic children in the study or if you, you know, kind of increase the study with the asthmatic children? Well, that means this, this air pollution index for children asthma calculated would be, it, it seems like it would be tighter, right? Because it would be more, more people, more asthma kids, you're going to get more dots in the same spot that are going to make that confidence interval a lot tighter. Okay, because you get, get more, the data should be more concise. But what's this whole standard error of the mean stuff? Well, you got to pray you don't get this on step one, but that's just basically, it's a formula, standard error of the mean, um, which is like uh, standard deviation. Uh, I, I guess I'm using, I'm using that term uh, over n. Now, the n is the key here. n is the number. Okay, now, a standard error of the mean, it kind of implies that the the error kind of goes away as the sample size uh, goes up, okay? So if you put more people in the study, what happens? The bottom number, the denominator, gets bigger. And if the, if the denominator gets bigger, then the whole number gets smaller. So if you're going to put more kids in this study, the standard error of the, error of the mean, and you have to, mem you'd have to memorize this, I mean, it's just, this is one of those really obscure ones, this guy is going to get smaller. So it could be this one, this one, or that one. Okay, But what do we say about the confidence interval? That if you put more people in the study, that confidence interval should get a little bit tighter. So the upper confidence interval should go down, okay, and the lower confidence interval should go up, right? Because it should go get to a higher number over here, and it should go up. So really the only answer that has all of them is going to be answer choice B. Okay. And the key with this, just knowing this, and I, and I, and I told you that, when I, especially when we did the formulas for pharmacology, I don't get lost in trying to plug and chug. It's all about, can I, can I put in, do I understand what happens if I, if I increase this guy, what happens to that guy? That's really where, they're, where, they're, where you got to put your money. Okay? 
the confidence interval gets tighter and standard error of the mean goes down. Now, when it comes to, the, you gotta fly through these. This is how I would study for nearly any topic if you got the questions, but especially biostats. You just gotta understand the concept. Don't work problems when you study. You, look, you, you work them one time, you write them out, and then just tell yourself, do you understand what you did here? Specificity, well I know sensitivity goes down, specificity goes up, so it should be 180. I put that on top because I circled it, and then it goes up, so whatever boxes I combine, 180 plus 20, um, so it'd be 180 here, 180 plus 20 on the bottom, and that goes, and it should be uh, 90, 90%, I don't even know why I didn't uh, circle that. So that's gonna be the specificity. But make sure you, you understand sensitivity, specificity, positive value, negative value, and how you do that. So again, you, you just look at this and then mentally go through it. You don't have to work the problem each time. It's a lot quicker this way. The scatter, you see one that has a scatter plot, you're looking for the correlations, right? The, the, the correlation of, of age of income to closest, which is the following, okay? The, the below scatter diagram shows correlation between income and age in the United States. And you can see it goes in this direction. But when it goes in that direction, if you remember from the middle school math, you know, it's like, uh, <clears throat> if you go to the positive in the x direction, it's a positive number and it ups positive. So positive and positive, this is going to be in the positive direction. Um, if it went down that way, of course, it would be in the negative slope, okay? Which is, you know, negative, and even though this is a positive direction, negative and positive is going to be a negative, okay? It's like this. If something bad happened to a good person, that's a bad thing. If something good happened to a good person, that's a good thing. Um, so anyways, you get the positive number. Now, this stuff is how tightly these, these dots are correlated to that line, right? So you know that if, if, if those dots were basically right on that line, then that's going to be like a 1, okay, positive 1. But these are just off that, not too bad, not, not obscurely off, right? They're not big time off. They're just a little bit off. So I say it correlate most, like, most nicely with 0.9, okay? But understand the directions for those. You know, when you look at this problem, you say, okay, they're going to ask about case control and cohort. And so, again, five-year studies plan to assess the incidence and etiology of respiratory disease 600, in 600 individuals greater than 50 years of age. The study consists of two groups. One group cares for a pet dog, and the second group does not care for any animals in the household. At the onset of respiratory symptoms, cultures and serological studies will be performed. Which of the following best describes the study? What was the key to this question? is that at the beginning of this study, did anybody have any symptoms? No. So both groups, both groups did not have symptoms. Remember, when it's, when it's an A and an O, one group has it, one group does not. When it's a cohort, right, because this A and an O stands for case control. The O and O is cohort. So when, at the beginning of this study, nobody had a disease, so it's going to be a cohort. Now, they, and what is associated cohort? The word relative risk. If it was case control, one group has it, one group doesn't, that's associated with the word odds ratio. So I say case control, odds ratio, one number over one number. We'll get to that later. Uh, cohort study, as an O and an O, associated with relative risk, one number over two. This question, a study designed to diagnose prostate cancer is being evaluated. The sensitivity of the test is 70%, specificity is 90 in the studies, there's 100 patients who truly have UTIs, 200 who do not. How many false negatives? Now, they could change that anyways, but if, in, you know, to any of, the, any of the four types, you know, true positive, uh, false positive, true negative. So always draw your box. When you see these, always draw your box. Reality, test, you got to label it, positive, negative. It said, remember, in, there's 100 patients who truly have UTIs, so in reality, 100 do, and then in 200, truly do not. But if we knew that the sensitivity was 70, sensitivity is only going to be on this side, right? Sensitivity is this box going down. And so if that box going down is this, we know there's 100 people in that category. So 100 people would be this guy plus this guy because there's 100 total. So he goes on bottom. We know it's 70%. We don't like percents. We like decimals. So now we can calculate the true positive, right, is 70 and if I know this guy is 70, the whole thing is 100, then I know this guy must be 30, okay? And it doesn't matter what they asked on this one, you could easily, easily ca uh, calculate each one. So again, when you study this, you look at it and say, do I understand the concept they're trying to teach me? Uh, no need to work it, you just gotta mentally go through this. 
This is the question that says when they move the marker, whether, whether it goes up or the marker goes down. By a marker for this people, 500 volunteers, 120 patients, changing the cutoff value of the biomarker from point C to point A. So we're going from C to A, or we're going down. And so what do we say? We take that middle line, we take the middle line, and we smash it to the left, okay? Now, <clears throat> you have to be able to label this, right? True positive, true negative. Those are always on the outside. Do we care about them? No, we don't. So, but the inside, we do care about. That's all we care about when it comes to this move the marker thing. <clears throat> so, Everybody keeps their last name. So on the right side, it's, it was a true positive, so this will be a false positive. On the left side, they were negative, so this one's going to be a keeps his last name, false negative. All I care about is whether those things get changed. And since I'm going from C to A, I take this line, I move it to the left, I smash it. So what's going to happen to this guy? He goes, oops, he goes, um, he goes down, and what happens to this guy? He goes up. So now I take that information, and I say... You know, I work the box. Sensitivity, well, sensitivity I know goes down, false negative went down, and if false negative goes down, the whole number goes up. So no, it's not lower, it would be higher. More true negatives? Um, no, we don't remember, we don't care about the outside, so that has nothing to do with it. More false negatives? No, we said false negatives went down in this one. Higher negative predictive value? Well, negative predictive value would be this guy going that way, so that's true negative over true negative plus false negative. And if the false negative went down, the negative predicted value went up, okay? So again, snapshot that, very good. The following graph shows the distribution values of, of a healthy group of, of a group of healthy and diseased people. Points A through E, blah, 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 blah. What cutoff would determine a sensitivity of 100%? Well, if we know sensitivity is this formula, right, based on our box, this formula, to get this guy 100%, meaning if I had a 10 over 10 is 100%, right? So I need these to be the same. So I need to get rid of this guy. I need to make him what? I need to make him zero. So where does this guy become zero? Well, if I look at this, where can I smash the false negative into oblivion, into zero? I would take it and go to the left. So <clears throat> where do I make the false negative zero to make my sensitivity my sensitivity 100%, right to point C. Now, if they said specificity, and don't memorize this, okay? I mean, yeah, you can say, oh, I can just memorize it. But understand the concept in case they mess with you a little bit. Where would I make, if to make it uh, specificity, um, it would be the false positive has to be zero, and I would move it this way to point E, okay, where he would be zero. But in this, in this case, sensitivity 100%, C. Okay, what, snapshot that? Good. Oops, sorry. And then this one. <clears throat> what will happen? Same concept, but in this one, they're saying, what if what what will happen to sensitivity and specificity of a test when the markers are moved from the solid that's outside to the dash one? So again, all we care about is just that centerpiece, right? All we care about is him. So we label it true positive, true negative. We don't care about those guys, but we care about the center. This centerpiece is false positive and false negative. But when we move from the solid to, the, to the, this one, what happens? That area in here got, it got, went from here to here. It got smaller. So what happened to false positive area? Smaller. What happened to false negative area? Got smaller. So these guys got smaller. Well, if this guy gets smaller, sensitivity, if the denominator gets smaller, sensitivity gets bigger. If the true negative gets smaller, right, the specificity gets bigger, and that's why it stands for choice A, okay? Again, snapshot it, mentally play that through your head. New instrument purchased by the hospital that checks serum levels of X. The published value for the standard is 40. The technologist runs the, the test on patient and getting the reading of this. What can be concluded? Well, if you gotta, you gotta know where you're shooting. So if the gold standard or the bullseye is 40, but then you're getting 70, 68, 672, 70, 75, you're not hitting the bullseye, but you're being pretty, you know, you're, you're over there hitting all close, close marks together, right? So if you hit the bullseye, you'd be considered accurate, okay? To hit 40, you're accurate, but they're not accurate. But they're pretty consistent over here, you know, getting all these things, so they're like this, right? So in this situation with this data, they were 
uh, precise, right? They were precise, but they were not accurate. They never got close to the bullseye, okay? Make sure you kind of understand that. This one says, based on the data, what is the relative risk for the development of prostate cancer in men who had no children compared to men who had children? The key with this, and I can't stress this enough, this is where I get a lot of the, the most questions from this is, they say, well, I don't understand. First aid has it written a certain way, and I'm saying you can't go by first aid because that only works in one way. If you understand this, and we read math problems top to bottom, left to right. When I say left to right, it's whatever they mention first goes on top. Now, first of all, relative risk, right? If I said, you know, um, you know, case control is associated with odds ratio, and that's one number over one number. If I said um, a cohort study, that's also associated with relative risk, and that's one number over two. Know the difference. You know, be able to recite that like the back of your hand. And so in this situation, relative risk is one number over two, but what goes on top? That's the key. What goes on top? It's whatever was said first. In this situation, it's development of prostate cancer of men who had no children compared to men who had children. So who goes on top? No children compared to men who had children, or, or yes, okay? Now they could have said had children versus no children. Then this, then the had children would go on top. But in this situation, it's no children. It's no children. So what do I, I go here? No. So what goes on top? 80. What goes on the denominator? That 80 plus 920 because it's relative risk. I gotta put two of them on there. What goes on the bottom? Whatever I said second. Where they had children. That's 220. Do I put one number or, or two numbers on bottom? Oh, I put two numbers. Why? Because it's relative risk. And it's 220 plus uh, 1280. The key with this, it's whatever they said first goes on top, okay? But you got to understand this piece here. Case control, odds ratio, one number over one number. Cohort, relative risk, one number over two. This one, remember, it says, new studies show that the mean HDL level of non-diabetic was 42 and the mean... Uh, HDL of a, and a diabetic was 35. The probability that this was due to chance was 0.5, 0 0.05. There is a 15% probability that concluded that there is no difference in HDL measurement when there actually was one. I like this question. It says, what is the p-value? Well, p-value, I think, of is something by chance. Well, we, they even tell, told us this. Chance was 0 0.05, okay? And we want our p-value to be less than 0 0.05, okay? 0 0.05 or, or better. So anyways, long story short, p-value of the study, 0.055%, piece of cake. What is the power of the study? Well, you gotta know the null hypothesis box, right? It's the same type of box. You put reality up top, test over here, H1 and then the null, H1 and the null. Top right box is the alpha error, type one, also known as p-value. Well, we knew that one, that was 0.05, all right? That's a no-brainer, but we gotta get, they're asking for the power, we need this box. So <clears throat> here's how they write the questions. There's a 15% probability of concluding that there is no difference in the H HDL measurement when there is one. So they're saying that the test is going to say, the, the test would say that there is no association when in reality there is one. And that fits right there. There's a 15% chance of that. So that's why you get the 0.15 in that box. Okay? This whole sentence describes that box right there in words. So then you put him in there. 1 minus beta is power, so then you go 1 minus 0.15, you get 0.85, and then that's your answer. This is really the, if they ask any null hypothesis questions, they can't ask any more than what you just learned here. They're gonna, they could ask you alpha error type 1 or p-value, but they have to give it to you, obviously. And they're either going to ask you, well, I'm telling you, they're going to ask you power, and they're going to give you, make you find beta, and it's probably going to be something just like that. There's only so many ways they can ask this. A study of 200 patients hospitalized with, com with complaints related to pneumonia showed that their serum cholesterol level is a normally distributed variable with a mean of 210, standard deviation of 15. Based on the study results, how many patients would you uh, expect to have cholesterol greater than 240? Well, it's greater than 240 is what they're asking for, right? And that's the kicker. It's greater than 240. So again, if the mean was 210, you put that dead center. they got to give you standard deviation of 15. Um, and so you know that one standard deviation is 68, two is 95, 
and 3 is 99.7. You gotta know these two at least, okay? You gotta have that memorized, unfortunately. So if two tens here, and you went one standard deviation out, that'll take you to 195, because all that is saying one, one standard deviation is 15, so you went down 15, and then you're gonna add 15 this way. So that's one standard deviation is from 195 to 225. So that's like saying 68% of the people fall within that range, 68% of that. Well, let's go out another standard deviation. Minus 15 this way, add 15 that way. You get 180 and 240, and what's, what's that saying? That's saying that 95% of all the people in the study fall in that range, 95% of 200. Well, 95% of 200 is 190, so they're saying 190 people fall within this. And there's our 240, because the question said, how many would you expect to have greater than 240? Now, they didn't say how many are on the outsides and remaining. They said how many is above 240. Well, if I got 190 people in here, and there's 200 people in the study, that's 10 people unaccounted for. There's 10 people outside. Five of them are down here, and five of them are up there. And that's why the answer is going to be five, because it's how many was greater than 240. Good question. Okay. This one says, a test is being conducted to determine if older students have a lower U.S. Simulation Step 1 as compared to younger students. A group of older students greater than 50 who took Step 1 compared to a group of younger students who took Step 1. Data is shown below. Blah, 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 blah. Here's the box. Okay. What type of test is being conducted? Well, um, you know, in this situation, one group has a low test score and one group does not, in theory. Not a great worded question, but at the end of the day, if one group has it and one group doesn't, it's going to be a case control. Okay? And then are case control studies, like, if I know one group has it and one group doesn't have it or, or whatever, do I care what happens moving forward for the most part? No. If I want to know the answer to this, i got to look backwards, and that's why a case control, also associated with odds ratio, is retrospective. Okay, cohort, oh no, nobody has it. Okay, nobody would have it yet. So I can look backwards to get some data and I can follow these people moving forward. So it's retro and uh, forward uh, prospective as well. Okay, and that's associated with relative risk, one number over two. So in this situation, one group had it, the low test score, one group did not. One group has it, one group does not, case control. They could have put what, what, what word is associated with the type of test in this one, and they could have put like um, odds ratio, relative risk here, and you would have jumped all over odds ratio because that's what's associated with, uh, with this type of study, case control. And then this one. This goes back, it's the same worded question, but this one goes back, what is the odds of older students having a lower exam score compared to younger students? Now think about that. What goes on top? This is, an, this is a case control, so it's odds ratio. It's one number over one number. But which, what goes on top? And you better repeat this back to me. What goes on top? Whatever I said first in the sentence. What is the odds ratio of older students having a lower exam score compa compared to, this is, where you, this is like your big division sign, compared to younger students? So who goes on top? Older. Who goes on bottom? Younger. So. The older, here's my older group, so that happens to be the right box. Could have been the left one, it happens to be the right one, so I gotta take this data, 60. It's odds ratio, so it's one number over one number, so it's 60 over 20. If this was a relative risk, I'd put 60 over 60 plus 200. Okay, okay 60 plus 200. So, <clears throat> again, let me repeat that because I might have said it too fast, or I might have said something wrong a second ago. Case control, odds ratio, one number over one number. So in this situation, it's 60 over 200 if this was a relative um, risk, it would be one number over two, and it would be 60 over 60 plus 200, okay? There's a difference. But we're back to case control, odds ratio, one number over one number, old on top, young on bottom. Why? Because I said older people first, compared to is my division, younger people on bottom, because I said it second. And then young, less than 50, um, younger, is 40 over 160. And that's why we got answer choice C, okay? But you don't memorize the formula. You got to know whichever one, whichever one they said first. So, <clears throat> again, guys, this is 
just kind of a quick way to get through the, the biostats. And I just say, I look at these. When I study this, I look at them and say, what was the concept? Oh, standard error. I got into that. I go through this. Specificity. Okay, I got that. I got that. I got that. I got that. There's no need to work these problems um, out over and over. You just got to look at them, and then you run through them. And this is how I would study pretty much each night um, with questions I, that I didn't know in any topic. And I would just run through these, and I'd have a book and I would just kind of keep running through the book uh, of all the questions that I didn't know. So anyways, guys, I hope this was helpful. And yeah, it's just a, kind of a revisitation of the, of the biostats. And this is the common stuff that you kind of see on uh, your step exam. And I'll try to upload these um, online. It may take a while. It always takes a while, it seems. But again, we're here to help, here to move forward. And you know, I think uh, the day that we made this video, people are starting to put their, the residency applications in and get interviews. So it's pretty exciting. I was happy to uh, be part of that with some people that I'm working with on that. So hope it's helpful, guys.